All right. That's good enough. Hopefully this is actually streaming this time. Uh, last week I did the whole stream. I read through the entire chunk I was going to read through, but uh, none of it transmitted. Which was a tragedy. But hey, here we are. I get to read it again. So that's nice. Um, it is pretty cool, and there are some serious moments in here. Uh, so, last time, meaning two weeks ago, we had left off um, at the end of part three of a four-part novel uh, of Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings, the book of Greg Haljan. Uh, and uh, the our plucky titular protagonist, uh, Greg, and um, Anita Prince uh, had uh, just escaped from the Martian brigand ship that had come all the way from Ferrick Shan on Mars uh, to assist Miko uh, in their heist of the radium the grant line radium ore uh mine which is a secret to everybody uh, except for the people who know about it um a secret to the world at large <laughs> let's put it that way uh so they got away uh with the help of snap and uh venza uh who came in a uh a little flyer using gravity plates salvaged from the planetara uh, and flew them back away to safety to the grant line camp uh, and the at the end of at the very end the uh, martians the martians the brigands uh, which are mostly martians <laughs> as it happens almost entirely martians at this point um uh, have begun their attack on the camp. Alrighty. Brigands of the Moon, The Book of Greg Halgen, Conclusion of a Four-Part Novel by Ray Cummings. Chapter 34, The First Encounters It seemed, with that first shot from the enemy, that a great relief came to me, an apprehension fallen away. We had anticipated this moment for so long, dreaded it. I think all our men felt it. A shout went up. Harmless! But it was not that. But our building withstood it better than I had feared. It was a flash from a large electronic projector mounted on the deck of the brigand ship. It stabbed up from the shadows across the valley at the foot of the opposite crater wall, a beam of vaguely fluorescent light. Simultaneously, the searchlight vanished. The stream of electrons caught the front face of our main building in a six-foot circle. It held for a few seconds, vanished, then stabbed again, and still again. Three bolts. 
a total, I suppose, of nine or ten seconds. I was standing with Grantline at a front window. We had rigged an oblong of insulated fabric like a curtain. We stood, peering, holding the curtain cautiously aside. The ray struck some twenty feet away from us. Harmless! The men in the room shouted it with derision. But Grantline swung on them. Don't think that! An interior signal panel was beside Grantline. He called the duty men in the instrument room. It's over. What are your readings? The bombarding electrons had passed through the outer shell of the building's double wall and been absorbed in the rarefied, magnetized air current of the errant's circulation. Like poison in a man's veins, reaching his heart, the free alien electrons had disturbed the motors. They accelerated, then retarded, pulsed unevenly, and drew added power from the reserve tanks. But they had normalized at once once the shot was passed. The duty man's voice sounded from the grid in answer to Grantline's question. Five degrees colder at your building. Can't you feel it? The disturbed, weakened Erent's circulation had allowed the outer cold to radiate through a trifle. The walls had had a triple, a, a trifle extra explosive pressure from the room air. A strain, but that was all. It's probably their most powerful single weapon, Greg, Grantline said. I nodded. Yes, I think so. I had smashed the real giant with its ten-mile range. The ship was only two miles from us, but it seemed as though this projector were exerted to its distance limit. I had noticed on the deck only one of this type. The others, paralyzing rays and heat rays, were less deadly. Grantline commented, We can withstand a lot of that bombardment. If we stay inside... That ray, striking a man outside, would penetrate his errant suit within a few seconds, we could not doubt. We had, however, no intention of going out, unless for dire necessity. Even so, said Grantline, a hand shield would hold it off a certain length of time. We had an opportunity a moment later to test our insulated shields. The bolt came again. It darted along the front face of the building, caught our window, and clung. The double window shells were our weakest points. The sheet of flashing errant's current was transparent. We could see through it as though it were glass. It moved faster, but was thinner at the windows than in the walls. We feared the bombarding electrons might cross it, penetrate the inner shell, and, like a lightning bolt, enter the room. We dropped the curtain corner. The radiance of the bolt was dimly visible. A few seconds, then it vanished again, and behind the shield we had not felt a tingle. Harmless! But our power had been drained nearly an air on to neutralize the shock to the errant's current. Grantline said, If they kept that up, it would be a question of whose power supply would last longest, and it would not be ours. You saw our lights fade down while the bolt was striking. But the brigands did not know we were short of power, and to fire the projector with a continuous bolt would, in thirty minutes, perhaps, have exhausted their own power reserve. This strange warfare. It was, noon to, it was new to all of us, for there had been no wars on any of the three inhabited worlds for many years. Silent electronic conflict. Not a question of men in battle. A man at a switch on the brigand ship was the sole actor so far in this assault, and the results were visible only in the movement of the needle dials on our instrument panels. A struggle, so far, not of man's bravery or skill or strategy, but merely of electronic power supply. Yet warfare, however modern, can never transcend the human element. 
Before this insult was ended, I was to have many demonstrations of that. I won't answer them, Grantline declared. Our game is to sit defensive, conserve everything, let them make the leading moves. We waited half an hour, but no other shot came. The valley floor was patched with earthlight and shadow. We could see the vague outline of the brigand ship backed up at the foot of a, the opposite crater wall. The form of its dome over the illumined deck was visible, and the, ti and the line of its tiny hull ovals. On the rocks near the ship, helmet lights of prowling brigands occasionally showed. Whatever activity was going on down there, we could not see with the naked eye. Grantline did not use our telescope at first. To connect it, even for local range, drew on our precious ammunition of power. Some of the men urged that we search the sky with the telescope. Was our rescue ship from Earth coming? But Grantline refused. We were in no trouble yet. And every delay was to our advantage. Uh, Commander, where shall I put these helmets? A man came wheeling a pile of helmets on a little truck. At the manual port, other building. Our weapons and outside equipment were massed at the main exit locks of the large building, but we might want to sally out through the smaller locks also. Grantline sent helmets there. Suits were not needed, as most of us were garbed in them now, but without the helmets. Snap was still in the workshop. I went there during this first half hour of the attack. Ten of our men were busy there with the little flying platforms and the fabric shields. How is it, Snap? Almost all ready. He had six of the platforms, including the one we had already used, and at more than a dozen hand shields. At a squeeze, all of us could ride on these six little vehicles. We might have to ride them. We planned that, in the event of, the disa of disaster to the buildings, we could at least escape in this fashion. Food supplies and water were now being placed at the ports. Depressing preparations. Our buildings uninhabitable, a rush out and away, abandoning the treasure. Grantline had never mentioned such a contingency, but I noticed, nevertheless, that preparations were being made. Only that one shot, Greg? Snap's voice was raised over the clang of the workmen bolting the little gravity plates of the last platform. Four blasts, but just the one projector. They're strongest. He grinned. He wore no errant suit as yet. He stood in torn, grimy work trousers and a bedraggled shirt, with the inevitable red eye shade holding back his unruly hair. Around his waist was the weighted belt, and there were weights on his shoes for gravity stability. Didn't hurt us much. No. When I get in when I get the tube panels in this thing, I'll be finished. It'll take another half hour. I'll join you. Where are you stationed? I shrugged. I was at a front window with Johnny. Nothing to do as yet. Snap went back to his work. Well, the longer they delay, the better for us. If only your signal got through, Greg. We'll have a rescue ship here in a few hours more. Ah, that if. I turned away. Can't help you, Snap? Nah. Take those shields, he added to one of the men. Take them where? To Grantline. The front admission port, or the back. He'll tell you which. The shields were wheeled away on a little court. On a little cart. <laughs> I followed it. Grantline sent it to the back exit. No other move from them yet, Johnny? No, all quiet. Snap's almost finished. The brigands presently made another play. A giant heat ray beam came across the valley. It clung to our front wall for nearly a minute. Grantline got the reports from the instrument room. He laughed. That helped us rather than hurt us. Heated the outer wall. Frank took advantage of it and eased up the motors. We wondered if Miko knew that. Doubtless he did, for another interval passed, and the heat ray was not used again. Then came a Zed ray. I stood at the window, watching it, faint sheen of beam in the dimness. 
It crept with sinister deliberation along our front building wall, clung momentarily to our shielded windows, and pried with its revealing glow into Snap's workshop. Looking us over, Grantline commented. I hope they like what they see. I knew he did not feel the bravado that was in his tone. We had nothing but small hand weapons. Heat rays, electronic projectors, and bullet projectors. All for very short-range fighting. If Miko had not known that before, he could at least make a good guess at it after the careful Zedray inspection. With his ship down there two miles away, we were powerless to reach him. It seemed that Miko was now testing the use of all his mechanisms. A light flare went up from the dome peak of his ship. It rose in a slow arc over the valley and burst. For a few seconds, the two-mile circle of crags was brilliantly illumined. I stared, but I had to shield my eyes against the dazzling actinic glare, and I could see nothing. Was Miko making a Zedray photograph of our interiors? We had no way of knowing. He was testing his short-range projectors now. With my eyes again accustomed to the normal earth light in the valley, I could see the stabs of little electronic beams, the Martian paralyzing rays and heat beams. They darted out like flashing swords from the rocks near the ship. Then the whole ship and the crater wall behind it seemed to shift sidewise as a Benson curve light spread its glow about the ship with a projector curve beam coming up and touching the window through which I was peering. Uh, Haljan, come look at these damn goyles. Commander, shall I stop them? They'll kill themselves, or kill us. Smash something. We followed the man into the building's broad central corridor. Anita and Venza were riding a midget flying platform. Anita in her boyish black garb, Venza with a flowing white Venus robe. They lay on the tiny, six-foot oblong of metal, one manipulating its side shields, the other at the controls. As we arrived, the platform came sliding down the narrow confines of the corridor, lurching, barely missing a door-grid projection, up to skim the low, vaulted ceiling, then down to the floor. It sailed past our heads, rising over us as we ducked. Anita waved her hand. Grantline gasped. By the infernal! I shouted, Anita, stop! But they only waved at us, skimming down the length of the corridor, seeming to avoid a smash a dozen times by the smallest margin of chance, stopping miraculously at the further end, hanging poised in midair, wheeling, coming back, undulating up and down. Grantline clung to me. By the gods of the airways! In spite of my astonished horror, I could not but share Grantline's obvious admiration. Three of... Three or four other men were watching. The girls were amazingly skillful, no doubt of that. There was not a man among us who could have handled that gravity platform indoors, not one who would have had the brash temerity to try it. The platform landed with the grace of a hummingbird at our feet, the girls dexterously balancing so that it came to rest swiftly, without the least bump. I confronted them. Anita, what are you doing? She stood up, flushed and smiling. Practicing? Imperturbable girls, the product of their age. Ob oblivious to the brigand attack, they were in here practicing. What for? I demanded. Venza's roguish eyes twinkled at me. Her hands went to her slim hips with a gesture of defiance. She asked, Are you speaking for yourself or the commander? Thank you, Maddie. I improve, I, I'm happy for your support. Sorry, I didn't notice I was in the middle of the reading. I ignored her. What for? I reiterated. Because we're good at it, Anita retorted. Better than any of you men. If you should need us... We don't. We won't, I said shortly. But if you should... Venza put in. If Snap and High hadn't come for you, you wouldn't be here, Greg Haljan. I didn't notice you were so horrified to see me holding that shield up over you. It silenced me. She added, Commander, let us alone. We won't smash anything. 
Grantline laughed. I hope you won't. A warning call took us back to the front window. The brigand's search beam was again being used. It swept slowly along the length of the cliff. Its circle went down the cliff steps to the valley floor and came sweeping up again. Then it went up to the observatory platform at the summit above us, then back and crept over to the ore sheds. We had no men outside, if that's what would if that's what the brigand wanted to determine. The search beam presently vanished. It was replaced immediately by a zed ray, which darted at once to our treasure sheds and clung. That stung Grantline into his first action. We flung our own zed ray down across the valley. It reached the brigand ship. This zed ray and a searchlight were our only two projectors of long range. The brigand ray vanished when ours flashed on. I was with Grantline at an image grid in the instrument room. We saw the deck of the brigand ship and the blurred interior of the cabins. Try the search beam, Frank. We don't need the other. The Zed Ray went off. We gazed down our searchlight, which clung to the dome of the distant enemy vessel. We could see movement there. The telescope, Grantline ordered. The little dynamos hummed. The telescope finder glowed and clarified. On the deck of the ship we saw the brigands working with the assembling of the ore carts. A deck landing port was open. The ore carts were being carried out through a port lock and down a landing incline. And on the rocks outside we saw several of the carts, and rail sections and the sections of an ore chute. Miko was unloading his mining apparatus. He was making ready to come up for the treasure. The discovery, startling as it was, nevertheless was far overshadowed by an imperative danger alarm from our main building. Brigands were outside on our ledge. Miko's search beam, sweeping the ledge a moment before, had carefully avoided revealing them. It had been done just for that purpose, no doubt, making us sure that the ledge was unoccupied, and thus to guard against our own light making a search. But there was a brigand group here close outside our walls. By the merest chance, the radiating glow from our search ray had shown the helmeted figures scurrying for shelter. Grantline leaped to his feet. We rushed for the rear exit port which was nearest us. The giant bloated figures had been seen running along the outside of the connecting corridor in this direction. But before we ever got there, a new alarm came. A brigand was crouching at a front corner of the main building. His hydrogen heat torch had already opened a rift in the wall. drinking water here is thirsty work uh but yeah no thanks i'm happy to hear that you love story time saturday i do too it's definitely my favorite of the streams i do throughout the week Chapter 35, Desperate Offensive In with you, ordered Grantline. Get your helmets on. How many? Six? Enough. Get back there, Williams. You were the last. The lock won't hold any more. I was one of the six who jammed into the manual exit lock. We went through it. In a moment, we were outside. It was less than three minutes since the prowling brigands had been seen. Grantline touched me just as we emerged. Don't wait for orders. Get them. That fellow with the torch, the most dangerous. Yes, I'm with you. We went out with a rush. We had already discarded our shoe and belt weights. I leaped, regardless of my companions. The scurrying Martians had disappeared. Through my visor bullseye I could see only the earthlit rocky surface of the ledge. Beside me stretched the dark wall of our building. I bounded toward the front. 
The brigand with the torch had been at this front corner. I could not see him from here. He had been crouching just around the angle. I had a tiny bullet projector, the best weapon for short-range outdoors. I was aware of Grantline close behind me. It took only a few of my giant leaps. I landed at the corner, recovered my balance, and whirled around to the front. The Martian was here, a giant misshapen lump as he crouched. His torch was a little stab of blue in the deep shadow enveloping him. Intent upon his work, he did not see me. Perhaps he thought his fellows had broken our exits by now. I landed like a leopard upon his back and fired, my weapon muzzle ramming him. His torch fell, hissing with a silent rain of blue fire upon the rocks. As my grip upon him made audiophone contact, his agonized scream rattled the diaphragms of my ear grids with horrible, deafening intensity. He lay writhing under me, then was still. His scream choked into silence. His suit deflated within my encircling grip. He was dead. My leaden, steel-tipped pellet had punctured the double surface of his errant's fabric, penetrated his chest. Grantline's following leap landed him over me. Dead? Yes. I climbed from the inert body. The torch had hissed itself out. Grantline swung on our building corner, and I leaned down with him to examine it. The torch had fused and scarred the surface of the wall, burned almost through. A pressure rift had opened. We could see it, a curving gash in the metal wall plate, like a crack in a glass window pane. I went cold. This was serious damage. The rarefied errant's air would seep out. It was leaking now. We could see the magnetic radiance of it all up the length of the ten-foot crack. The leak would change the pressure of the errant's system, constantly lower it, demanding steady renewal. The errant's motors would overheat. Some might go bad from the strain. Grantline stood, gripping me. Damn bad. Yes. Can't we repair it, Johnny? No. Have to take that whole plate section out. Shut off the errant's plant and exhaust the interior air of all this bulkhead of the building. Day's job. Maybe more. And the crack would get worse, I knew. It would gradually spread and widen. The errant's circulation would fail. All our power would be drained, struggling to maintain it. This brigand, who had unwittingly committed suicide by his daring act, had accomplished more than he perhaps had realized. I could envisage our weapons, useless from lack of power, the air in our buildings turning fetid and frigid, ourselves forced to the helmets. A rush out to abandon the camp and escape. The buildings exploding, scattering into a litter on the ledge like a child's broken toy. The treasure abandoned, with the brigands coming up and loading it on their ship. Our defeat. In a few hours from now, or minutes, this crack could slowly widen, or it could break suddenly at any time. Disaster come now so abruptly upon us at the very start of the brigand attack. Grantline's voice in my audiophone broke my despairing rush of thoughts. Bad. Come on, Greg, nothing to do here. We were aware that our other four men had run along the building's other side. They emerged now, with the running brigands in front of them, rushing out toward the staircase on the ledge. Three giant Martian figures in flight, with our four men chasing. A bullet projector spat with its queer stab of exploding powder fed by the burning oxygen fumes of its artificial air chamber, one of our men firing. A brigand fell to the rocks by the brink of the ledge. The others reached the descending staircase, tumbled down it with reckless leaps. Our men turned back. Before we could join them, the enemy ship down in the valley sent up a cautious search beam, which located its returning men. Then the beam swung up to the ledge landed upon us. We stood confused, blinded by the brilliant glare. Grantline stumbled against me. Run, Greg! They'll be firing at us! We dashed away. 
Our companions joined us, rushing back for the port. I saw it open, reinforcements coming out to help us, half a dozen figures carrying a ten-foot insulated shield. They could barely get it out through the port. The Martian search ray abruptly vanished. Then, almost instantly, the electronic ray came with its deadly stab. Missed us at first, as we ran for the shield. It vanished and stabbed again. It caught us, but now we were behind the shield, carrying it back to the port, hiding behind it. The ray stabbed once or twice more. Whether Miko's instruments showed him how serious that damage was to our front wall, we never knew. But I think that he realized. His search beam clung to it, and his Zed ray pried into our interiors. The brigand ship was active now. We were desperate. We used our telescope freely for observation, and use our, used our Zed ray and searchlight. Miko's ore carts and mining apparatus were unloaded on the rocks. The rail sections were being carried a mile out, nearly to the center of the valley. A subsidiary camp was being established there, only a mile from the base of our cliff, but still far beyond the reach of our weapons. We could see the brigand lights down there. Then the ore chute sections were brought over. We could see Miko's men carrying some of the giant projectors, mounting them in the new position. Power tanks and cables, light flare catapults, little mechanical cannons for throwing the bombs. The enemy searchlight constantly raked our vicinity. Occasionally, the giant electronic projector flung up its bolt, as though warning us not to dare leave our buildings. Half an hour went by. Our situation was even worse than Miko could know. The Erentz motors were running hot, our power draining, the crack widening. When it would break, we could not tell, but the danger was like a sword over us. An anxious thirty minutes for us, this second interlude. Grantline called a meeting of all our little force, with every man having his say. Inactivity was no longer a feasible policy. We recklessly used our power to search the sky. Our rescue ship might be up there, but we could not see it with our disabled instruments. No signals came. We could not, or at least did not, receive them. They wouldn't signal, Grantline protested. They'd know the Martians would be more likely to get the signal than us. Of what use to warn Miko? But he did not dare wait for a rescue ship that might or might not be coming. Miko was playing the waiting game now, making ready for a quick loading of the ore when we were forced to abandon our buildings. The brigand ship suddenly moved its position. It rose up in a low, flat arc, came forward, and settled in the center of the valley, where the carts and rail sections were piled, and the outside projection projectors, and the outside projectors newly mounted on the rocks. But the projectors only shot at us occasionally. The brigands now began laying the rails from the ship toward the base of our cliff. The chute would bring o the ore down from the ledge, and the carts would take it to the ship. The laying of the rails was done under cover of occasional stabs from the electronic projector. And then we discovered that Miko had made still another move. The brigand rays, fired from the depths of the valley, could strike our front building, but could not reach all our ledge. And from the ship's new and nearer position, this, this disadvantage was intensified. Then abruptly we realized that under cover of darkness bombs, an electronic projector and search ray had been carried to the top of the crater rim, diagonally across and only half a mile from us. Their beams shot down, raking all our vicinity from this new angle. I was on the little flying platform which sallied out as a test to attack these isolated projectors. Snap and I and one other volunteer went. He and I held the shield. Snap handled the controls. 
Our exit port was on the lee side of the building from the hostage... Sur host wow, okay. <laughs> Let's try that again. Our, e our exit... Uh, <clears throat> hmm. Our exit port was on the lee side of the building from the hostile search beam. We got out and observed and sailed upward, but soon a light from the ship caught us, and the projector bolts came up. Our sortie only lasted a few minutes. To me, it was a confusion of crossing beams, with the stars overhead, the swaying little platform under me, and the shield tingling in my hands when the blasts struck us. Moments of blurred terror. The voice of the man beside me sounded in my ears. Now, Halgen, give him one! We were up over the peak of the rim with the hostile projectors under us. I gauged our movement and dropped an explosive powder bomb. It missed. It flared with a puff on the rocks, twenty feet from where the two projectors were mounted. I saw that two helmeted figures were down there. They tried to swing their grids upward, but could not get them vertical to reach us. The ship was firing at us, but it was far away, and Grantline's search beam was going full power, clinging to the ship to dazzle them. Snap circled us. As we came back, I dropped another bomb. Its silent puff seemed littered with the flying fragments of the two projectors and the bodies of the men. We flew swiftly back and got in. It decided Grantline. For an hour past, Snap and I had been urging our plan to use the gravity platforms. To remain inactive was sure defeat now. Even if our buildings did not explode, if we thought to huddle in them, helmeted in the falling air, failing air, helmeted in the failing air, then Miko could readily ignore us and proceed with his loading of the treasure under our helpless gaze. He could do that now with safety, if we refused to sally out, for we could not fire our weapons through our windows. And there's a footnote here. To fire a projector through the walls or windows would at once wreck the protective errants system. The enemy ship has pressure ports, constructed for the emission of the weapon rays. Grantline's only weapons thus mounted were his search beam and Z-ray. To remain defensive would end inevitably in our defeat. We all knew it now. It was obvious. The waiting game was Miko's, not ours and he was playing it. The success of our attack upon the distant, isolated projectors heartened us. Yet it was a desperate offensive indeed upon which we now decided. We prepared our little expedition at the larger of the exit ports. Miko's Zedray was watching all our interior movements. We made a brave show of activity in our workshop, with abandoned ore carts which were stored there. We got them out, started to recondition them. It seemed to fool Miko. His Zed-Ray clung to the workshop, watching us. And at the distant port we gathered the little platforms, the shields, helmets, bombs, and a few hand projectors. There were six platforms, three of us upon each. It left four people to remain indoors. I need not describe the emotion with which Snap and I listened to Venza and Anita pleading to be allowed to accompany us. They urged it upon Grantline, and we took no part. It was too important a decision. The treasure, the life or death for all of these men, hung now upon the fate of our venture. Snap and I could not intrude our personal feelings. And the girls won. Both were undeniably more skillful at handling the midget platforms than any of us men. Two of the six platforms could be guided by them. That was a third of our little force. And of what use to go out and be defeated, leaving the girls here to meet death almost immediately afterward? We gathered at the port. A last-minute change made Grantline order six of his men to remain guarding the buildings. The instruments, the errands system... All the appliances had to be attended. It left four platforms, each with three men, with Grantline at the controls of one of them. 
and upon the other two of the six Venza rode with Snap, and I with Anita. We crouched in the shadows outside the port. So small an army sallying out to bomb this enemy vessel or be killed in the attempt. Only sixteen of us, and thirty or so brigands. I envisaged, then, that this tiny moon crater, the scene of this battle we were waging. Struggling humans, desperately trying to kill, alone here on this globe. Around us, the wide reaches of lunar desolation. In all this world, every human being was gathered here, struggling to kill. Anita drew me down to the platform. Ready, Greg. The others were rising. We lifted, moved slowly out and away from the protective shadows of the building. In a tiny queue, the six little platforms sailed out over the valley toward the brigand ship. All right. Action packed. Now it gets real. Okay. Chapter 36, The Battle in the Crater Grantline led us. We held about level. Five hundred feet beneath us, the brigand ship lay, cradled on the rocks. When it was still a mile away from us, I could see all its outline fairly clearly in the dimness. Its tiny hull windows were now dark, but the blurred shape of the hull was visible, and above it the rounded cap of dome, with a dim radiance beneath it. We followed Grantline's platform. It was rising, drawing the others after it like a tail. I touched Anita where she lay beside me, with her head half in the small hooded control bank. Go going too high. She nodded, but followed the line nevertheless. It was Grantline's command. I lay crouched, holding the inner tips of the flexible side shields. The bottom of the platform was covered with the insulated fabric. There were two side shield. There were. Ugh. <clears throat> there were. Mm. <laughs> there were two side shields. They extended upwards some two feet, flexible so that I could hold them out to see over them, or draw them up and in to cover us. They afforded a measure of protection against the hostile rays, though just how much we were not sure. With the platform level, a bolt from beneath could not harm us unless it continued for a considerable time. But the platform, except upon direct flight, was seldom level, for it was a frail, unstable little vehicle. To handle it was more than a question of the controls. We balanced, and helped to guide it, with the movement of our bodies, shifting our weight sidewise, or back, or forward to make it dip as the controls altered the gravity pull in its tiny plate sections. Like a bird, wheeling, soaring, swooping. To me, it was a precarious business. But now we were in straight flight diagonally upward. The outline of the brigand ship came under us. I crouched, tense, breathless. Every moment it seemed that the brigands must discover us and loose their bolts. They may have seen us for some moments before they fired. I peered over the side shield down at our mark, then up ahead to get Grantline's firing signal. It seemed long delayed. We were almost over the ship. An added glow down there must have warned Grantline that a shot was coming. The tiny red light flared bright on his platform. I hissed on our Benson curve-light radiance. 
We had been dark, but a soft glow now enveloped us. Its sheen went down to the ship to reveal us, but its curving path showed us falsely placed. I saw the little line of platforms ahead of us seem to move suddenly sidewise. It was everyone for himself now. None of us could tell where the other, where the other platforms actually were placed or headed. Anita swooped us sharply down to avoid a possible collision. Greg? Yes, I'm aiming. I was making ready to drop the little explosive globe bomb. Our search ray, our searchlight ray at the camp, answering Grantline's signal, shot down and bathed the ship with a white glare, revealing it for our aim. Simultaneously, the brigand bolts came up at us. I held my bomb out over the shield, calculating the angle to throw it down. The brigand rays flashed around me. They were horribly close. Miko had understood our, su our sudden visible shift and aimed. Not where... Uh, let's try that again. Because of the line break. <laughs> it threw off my rhythm. They were horribly close. Miko had understood our sudden visible shift and aimed not where we appeared to be, but where we had been a moment before. I dropped my bomb hastily at the glowing white, white ship. The touch of a hostile ray would have exploded it in my hand. I could see its blue sizzling fuse as it fell. I saw the others also dropping from our nearby platforms. The explosions from them merged into a confusion of white glare. And a cloud of black light mist as the brigands out on the rocks used their occulting darkness bombs. We swept past in a blur of leaping hostile beams. Silent battle of lights. Darkness bombs down at the ship struggling to bar our camp search ray. The Benson radiance rays from our passing platforms curving down to mingle with the confusion. The electronic rays sending up their bolts. Our platforms dropped some ten dynamite bombs in that first passage over the ship. As we sped by, I dimmed the Benson's radiance. I peered. We had not hit the ship. Or if we had, the damage was inconclusive. But on the rocks I could see a pile of ore carts scattered. Broken wreckage, in which the litter of two or three projectors seemed strewn. And the gruesome, deflated forms of several helmeted figures. Others seemed to be running, scattering, hiding in the rocks and pit holes. Brigand... Twenty brigands at least were outside the ship. Some were running over toward the base of our camp ledge. The darkness bombs were spreading like a curtain over the valley floor, but it seemed that some of the figures were dragging their projectors away. We sailed off toward the opposite crater rim. I remember passing over the broken wreckage of Grantline's little spaceship, the Comet. Miko's bolts momentarily had vanished. We had hit some of his outside projectors. The others were abandoned, or being dragged to safer positions. After a mile, we wheeled and went back. I suddenly realized that only four platforms were in the reformed line ahead of us. One was missing. I saw it now, wavering down close over the ship. A bolt leaped up diagonally from a distant angle on the rocks and caught the disabled platform. It fell, whirling, glowing red, disappeared into the blur of darkness like a bit of heated metal plunged into water. One out of six of our platforms already lost. Three men of our little force gone. But Grantline led us desperately back. Anita caught his signal to break our line. The five platforms scattered, dipping and wheeling like frightened birds, blurring shapes shifting unnaturally in flight as the Benson curve angles were altered. Anita now took our platform in a long swoop downward. Her tense, murmured voice sounded in my ears. Hold off, I'll take us low. A melee. Passing platform ships. The darting bolts crossing like ancient rapiers. Falling blue points of fuse lights as we threw our bombs. Down in a swoop. Then rising. Away, then back. 
this silent warfare of lights. It seemed that around me must be bursting a pandemonium of sound. Yet I heard nothing. Silent, blurred melee, infinitely frightening. A bolt struck us, clung for an instant, but we weathered it. The light was blinding. Through my gloves I could feel the tingle of the overcharged shields as it caught and absorbed the hostile bombardment. Under me the platform seemed heated. My little Erentz motors ran with ragged pulse. I got too much oxygen. My head roared with it. Spots danced before my closed eyes. Then not enough oxygen. I was dully smothering. Then the bolt was gone. I found us soaring upward, horribly tilted. I shifted over. Anita, Anita, dear. Yes, Greg, all right. The melee went on. The brigand ship and all its vicinity was enveloped in the darkness mist now, a turgid sable curtain, made more dense by the dissipating heavy fumes of our exploding bombs, which settled low over the ship and the rocks nearby. The searchlight from our camp stro camp <laughs> the searchlight from our camp strove futilely to penetrate the cloud. Our platforms were separated. One went by high over us. I saw another dart close beneath my shield. God, Anita! Too close! I did not mean that. I didn't see it. Almost a collision. Oh, Greg, haven't we broken the ship's dome yet? It seemed not. I had dropped nearly all my bombs. This could not go on much longer. Had it only been five minutes? Only that? Reason told me so, yet it seemed an eternity of horror. Another swoop. My last bomb. Anita had brought us into position to fling it. But I could not. A bolt stabbed up from the gloom and caught us. We huddled, pulling the shields up and over us. Blurred darkness again. Too much to the side now. I had to wait while Anita swung us back. Then we seemed too high. We swooped, but not too low. Down in the darkness mist we would immediately have lost direction and crashed. I waited with my last bomb. The other platforms were occasionally dropping them. I had been too hasty, too prodigal. Had we broken the ship's dome with a direct hit? It seemed not. The brigands were occasionally sending up catapulted light flares. They came from positions on the rocks outside the ship. They mounted in lazy curves and burst over us. The concealing darkness, broken only by the flares of our explosions, enveloped the enemy. Our camp's searchlight was still struggling with it. But overhead, where the few little platforms were circling and swooping, the flares gave an almost continuous glare. It was dazzling, blinding. Even through the smoked pain which I adjusted to my visor, I could not stand it. But there were thoughts of comparative dimness. In a... In a patch where the earthlight struck through the darkness of the rocks, I saw another of our fallen platforms. Snap and Venza! Dear God! It was not they, but three figures of our men. One was dead. Two had survived the fall. They stood up, staggering. And in that instant, before the turgid black curtain closed over them, I saw two brigands come rushing. Their hand projectors stabbed at close range. Our men crumpled and fell. And now I saw why probably we had never yet hit the ship. Its outline was revealed. Now, Greg, can you fling it from here? We were in position again. I flung my last missile, watched its light as it dropped. On the dome roof, two of Miko's men were crouching. My bomb was truly aimed, perhaps one of the few in all our bombardment which would have landed directly on the dome roof but the waiting marksman fired at it with short-range heat projectors and exploded it harmlessly while it was still above them. We swung up and away. I saw, high above us, Grantline's platform, recognizing its red signal light. 
there seemed a lull. The enemy fire had died down to only a very occasional bolt. In the confusion of my whirling impressions, I wondered if Miko were in distress. Not that! We had not hit his ship. Perhaps we had done little damage indeed. It was we who were in distress. Two of our platforms had fallen. Two out of six. Or more, of which I did not know. I saw one rising off to the side of us. Grantline was over us. Well, okay, let's try that again. <laughs> I saw one rising off to the side of us. Grantline was over us. Well, we were at least three. And then I saw the fourth. Grantline is calling us up, Greg. Yes. Grantline's signal light was summoning us from the attack. He was a thousand or two thousand feet above. I was suddenly shocked with horror. The search ray from our camp abruptly vanished. Anita wheeled us to face the distant ledge. The camp lights showed, and over one of the buildings was a distress light. Had the crack in our front wall th broken, threatening explosion of all the buildings? The wild thoughts swept me. But it was not that. I could see light stabs from the cliff outside the main building. Miko had dared to send some of his men to attack our almost abandoned camp. Grantline realized it. His red helmet light semaphored the command to follow him. His platform soared away, heading for the camp, with the other two behind him. Anita lifted us to follow, but I checked her. No, off to the right, across the valley. But Greg... Do as I say, Anita. She swung us diagonally away from both the camp and the brigand ship. I prayed that we might not be noticed by the brigands. Anita, listen. I've an idea. The attack on the brigand ship was over. It lay enveloped in the darkness of the powder gas cloud and its own darkness bombs. But it was uninjured. Miko had answered us with our own tactics. He had practically unmanned the ship, no doubt, and had sent his men to our buildings. The fight had shifted. But I was now without ammunition, save for two or three small bullet projectors. Of what use for our platform to rush back? Miko expected that. His attack on the camp was undoubtedly made just for that purpose. Anita, if we can get down on the rocks somewhere near the ship and creep up on it unobserved in that blackness... I might be able to open its manual hull lock, rip it open, and let the air out. If I could get into its pressure chamber and unseal the inner slide... It would wreck the ship, Anita, exhaust all its air. Shall we try it? Whatever you say, Greg. We seemed to be unobserved. We skimmed close to the valley floor, a mile from the ship. We headed slowly toward it, sailing low over the rocks. Then we landed, left the platform. Let me go first, Anita. I held a bullet projector. With slow, cautious leaps, we advanced. Anita was behind me. I had wanted to leave her with the platform, but she would not stay. And to be with me seemed at least equally safe. The rocks were deserted. I thought there was very little chance that any of the enemy would lurk here. We clambered over... <laughs> We clambered over the pitted, scarred surface. The higher crags, etched with earthlight, stood like sentinels in the gloom. The brigand ship with its surrounding darkness was not far from us. Then we entered the cloud. No one was out here. We passed the wreckage of broken projectors and gruesome, shattered human forms. We prowled closer. The hull of the ship loomed ahead of us, all dark. We came at last close against the sleek, metal hull side, slid along it toward where I was sure the manual port was located. Abruptly, I realized that Anita was not behind me. Then I saw her at a little distance, struggling in the grip of a giant helmeted figure. The brigand lifted her, turned, and, carrying her, ran the other way. 
I did not dare fire. I bounded after them along the hull side, around under the curve of the pointed bow, down along the other side. I had mistaken the hull port location. It was here. The running, bounding figure reached it, slid the panel. I was only fifty feet away, not much more than a single leap. I saw Anita being shoved into the pressure lock. The Martian flung himself after her. I fired at him, but missed. I came with a rush, and as I reached the port, it slid closed in my face, barring me. Oh, boy. Gotta get your girl back, Greg! Whatever will he do now? Chapter 37 In the Pressure Lock With puny fists I pounded the panel. A small pane in it was transparent. Within the lock I could see the blurred figures and her of Anita and her captor, and, it seemed, another figure. The lock was some ten feet square with a low ceiling. It glowed with a dim tube light. I pounded, thumped with futile, silent blows. The mechanism was here to open this manual, but it was now clasped from within and would not operate. A few seconds only, while I stood there in a panic of confusion, raging to get in. This disaster had come so suddenly. I did not plan. I had no thought save to batter my way in and rescue Anita. I recall that I beat on the glassite pane with my bullet projector until the weapon was bent and useless and I flung it with a wild, despairing rage at my feet. They were letting the ship's air pressure into this lock. Soon they would open the inner panel, step into the secondary chamber, and in a moment more would be within the ship's hull, corridor. Whoops. <laughs> and in a moment more would be within the ship's hull, corridor. Anita, lost to me! The outer panel suddenly opened. I had lunged against it with my shoulder. The giant figure inside slid it. I was taken by surprise. I half fell inward. Huge arms went around me. The goggled face of the helmet peered into mine. So it is you, Haljan. I thought I recognized that little device over your helmet bracket. And there is my little Anita come back to me again. Miko. This was he, his great bloated arms encircling me, bending me backward, holding me almost helpless. I saw over his shoulder that Anita was clutched in the grip of another helmeted figure. No giant, but tall for an Earthman, almost as tall as myself. Then the tube light in the room illumined the visor. I saw the face, recognized it. Moa! I gasped. So, I... Got you, Miko. Got me. You're a fool to the last, Greg Haljan. A fool to the last. But you were always a fool. I could scarcely move in his grip. My arms were pinned. As he slowly bent me backward, I wound my legs around one of his. It was as unyielding as a steel pillar. He had closed the outer panel. The air pressure in the lock was rising. I could feel it against my suit. My helmeted head was being forced backward. Miko's left arm held me. In his gloved right hand, as it came slowly up over my throat, I saw a knife blade, its naked, sharpened metal glistening blue-white in the light from overhead. I seized his wrist, but my puny strength could not hold him. The knife, against all my efforts, came slowly down. 
a moment of this slow, deadly combat, the end of everything for me. I was aware of the helmeted figure of Moa casting off Anita, and then the two girls leaping together upon Miko. It threw him off his balance, and my hanging weight made him topple forward. He took a step to recover himself. His hand with the knife was flung up with an instinctive, involuntary balancing gesture. As it came down, swiftly down again, I forced the knife blade to graze his throat, its point caught in the fabric of his suit. His startled oath jangled in my ears. The girls were clawing at him. We were all four scrambling, swaying. With despairing strength, I twisted at his waist. The knife went into his throat. I plunged it deeper. His suit went flabby. He crumpled over me and fell, knocking me to the floor. His voice, with the horrible gurgling rasp of death in it, rattled my ear grids. Not such a fool, are you, Haljan? Moa's helmeted head was close over us. I saw that she had seized the knife, jerked it from her brother's throat. She leaped backward, waving it. I twisted from under Miko's inert, lifeless body. As I got to my feet, Anita flung herself to shield me. Moa was across the lock, backed up against its wall. The knife in her hand went up. She stood for the briefest instant regarding Anita and me holding each other. I thought that she was about to leap upon us, but before I could move, the knife came down and plunged into her breast. She fell forward, her grotesque helmet striking the floor grid almost at my feet. Greg! She's dead. No, she moved. Get her helmet off. There's enough air in here. My helmet pressure indicator was faintly buzzing to show that a safe pressure was in the room. I shut off Moa's errant's motors, unfastened her helmet, raised it off. We gently turned her body. She lay with closed eyes, her pallid blue f her pallid face blue cast from the light in the lock. With our own helmets off, we knelt over her. Oh, Greg, is she dead? No, not quite, but dying. Oh, Greg, I don't want her to die. She was trying to help you there at the last. She opened her eyes. The film of death was glazing them. But she saw me, recognized me. Greg. Yes, Moa, I'm here. Her livid lips were faintly drawn in a smile. I'm so glad you took the helmets off, Greg. I'm going, you know. No. Going back to Mars to rest with the fire makers where I came from. I was thinking. Maybe you would kiss me, Greg? Anita gently pushed me down. I pressed the white, faintly smiling lips with mine. She sighed and ended it with a rattle in her throat. <sighs> Thank you, Greg. Closer. I can't talk so loudly. One of her gloved hands struggled to touch me, but she had no strength and it fell back. Her words were the faintest of whispers. There was no use living without your love. But I want you to see, now, that a Martian girl can die with a smile. Her eyelids fluttered down. It seemed that she sighed and then was not breathing. But on her livid face the faint smile still lingered to show me how a Martian girl could die. We had forgotten for the moment where we were. As I glanced up, I saw that through the inner panel past the secondary lock, the ship's hull corridor was visible, and along its length a group of Martians were advancing. 
They saw us and came running. Anita, look. We've got to get out of here. The secondary lock was open to the corridor. We jammed on our helmets. The unhelmeted brigands were... Whoops. The unhelmeted brigands by then were fumbling at the inner panel. I pulled at the lever of the outer panel. The brigands were hurrying, thinking they could be in time to stop me. One of the more cautious fumbled with a helmet. Anita, run! Try and keep your feet! Oh, that should have been done with the helmet on. Anita, run! Try and keep your feet! I slid the outer panel and pushed at Anita. Simultaneously, the brigands opened the inner port. The air came with a tempestuous rush. A blast through the inner port, through the little pressure lock. A wild rush out to the airless moon. All the air in the ship madly rushing to escape. Like feathers we were blown with it. I recall an impression of the hurtling brigand figures and swift flying rocks under me. A silent crash as I struck. Then, soundless, empty blackness. Oh, buddy. Oh, buddy. That was intense. Moa going out like a boss. Sort of. I mean, aside from the whole killing yourself thing. Still, went out with a smile. Pretty badass. Metal, as the kids say. Very metal. Or is that metal? Whatever. Chapter 38. Triumph. Is he conscious? We'd better take him back, get his helmet off. It's over. We can get back now. Venza, dear, we've won. It's over. He hears us. Greg! He hears us. He's all right. I opened my eyes. I lay on the rocks. Over my helmet, other helmets were peering, and faint, familiar voices mingled with the roaring in my ears. Back to the camp and get his helmet off. Are his motors smooth? Keep him right, Snap. He must have good air. I seemed unhurt. But Anita... She was here. Greg, dear one. Anita, safe. All four of us here on the earthlit rocks, close outside the brigand ship. Anita! She held me, lifted me. I was uninjured. I could stand. I staggered up and stood swaying. The brigand ship, a hundred feet away, loomed dark and silent, a lifeless bulk, already empty of air, drained in that mad blast outward. Like the wreck of the planetara, a dead, pulseless hulk already. We four stood together, triumphant. The battle was over. The brigands were worsted. Almost the last man of them dead or dying. No more than ten or fifteen had been available for that final assault upon the camp buildings. Miko's last strategy. I think perhaps he had intended, with his few remaining men, to take the ship and make away, deserting his fellows. All on the ship, caught unhelmeted by the explosion, were dead long since. I stood, listening to tr Snap's triumphant account. It had not been difficult for the flying platforms to hunt down the attacking brigands on the open rocks. We had only lost one more platform. Human hearts beat sometimes with very selfish emotions. It was a triumphant ending for us, and we hardly gave a thought that half of Grantline's little group had perished. We huddled on Snap's platform. It rose, lurching drunkenly, barely carrying us. And as we headed for the Grantline buildings, where still the rift in the wall had not quite broken, 
there came the final triumph. Miko had been aware of it, and he knew he had lost. Grantline's searchlight leaped upward, swept the sky, caught its sought-for object. A huge silver cylinder bathed brightly in the white search-beam glare. The police ship from Earth. Chapter 39. My Exit My narrative lies now in this permanently recorded form before you, and I prepare my exit bow with the humble hope that I may have given you pleasure. If, I, if so, I do beg you to tell me of it. There are some who already have flashed their approval of my discs. I thank them most earnestly and gratefully. My errors of recording unquestionably are many, and for them I ask your indulgence. There have been, I can readily see, errors of omission. I have not mentioned, for instance, the final rescue of the Planetara's marooned passengers on the asteroid. You will bear with me, since the disk space has its technical limitations, that such omissions have been unavoidable. Since the passage of the Earth Law by the Federated Board of Education, forcing narrative fiction to cling so closely to sworn facts of actual happening, I need offer no assurance of the truth of my narrative. My witnesses have filed their corroborating declarations. Indeed, the Planetara's wreck and the brigands' attack upon the moon treasure were given the widest newscaster's publicity, as you all know. Yet I, who was unwittingly involved in those stirring events, may have added a more personal note, making the scenes more vivid to your imagination. I have tried to do that. I do hope that in some measure you will think I have succeeded. There are many foolish girls now who say that they would like to know Greg Halgen. They doubtless would be very disappointed. I really crave no more publicity and the girls of all the universe have no charm for me. There is only one for me, an Earth girl. I think that life has very beautifully endowed me with its blessings. And that was Brigands of the Moon, the book of Greg Haljan, by Ray Cummings. How rad was that? I am, by the way, absolutely stealing that first uh, paragraph of chapter 39. My narrative now, my narrative lies now in this permanently recorded form before you, and I prepare my exit bow with the humble hope that I may have given you some pleasure. If so, I do beg you to tell me of it. There are some who already have flashed their approval of my discs. I thank them most earnestly and gratefully. And that is the truth. There are some people who have who have enjoyed what I've done, and that is that is all that matters. Thank you to everybody who listens to these. I do appreciate it. Uh, now that this one's done, I have actually received a uh, specific story request from someone, and I'll be doing that next week. It's a shorty, um, so I'll probably have another uh, short story that I've kind of wanted to read um, aloud here. Uh, as well for next week. Um, the one that was the request was is uh, The Last Question by Isaac Asimov, which is a great one. Um, excellent taste, by the way, <laughs> Rob, for, uh, for, rec for suggesting that one or requesting that one. Excellent taste. It is, de it is one of my personal favorites as well. And the other one I want to do um, is Blit, B-L-I-T, which is a short story by David Langford, uh, which has some pretty cool yet really horrifying uh, science fiction ideas. Uh, really freaky, like, mind screw stuff. Uh, it's, it's pretty good. Um, that alone will probably take up most of next week's stream. If not, then I have, like, an additional to fill in, uh, some space. Uh, 
But yeah, uh, thanks for tuning in. That was the concluding, the final segment of Brigands of the Moon by uh, Ray Cummings, which was uh, a four-part uh, novel, uh, or a novel in four parts, uh, that ran in the pages of Astounding Stories of Super Science, uh, March through June of 1930. Uh, and frankly, I think it's aged pretty well. Some of the language used is definitely uh, kind of a... Uh, it, it's clearly not from the modern era, but a lot of it aged pretty well. Um, it's got some... It's got some decent science fiction ideas, um, some cool science fiction ideas like the uh, that are fairly well fleshed out and consistent within the narrative, which is pretty great. It's also got some solid uh, actual science ideas, although I don't think you could die by falling from a crater on the moon easily. But if it was far enough, maybe I don't know um, if you landed on something badly. But the uh, the silent combat aspects where because there's no atmosphere around, you can't really hear anything. So there's like, l you know, energy beams flashing everywhere and uh, um, you know, bombs exploding, but you can hear none of it. None of it can you hear because it's all it's all quiet. So lots of good internal consistency in the ideas he has. Same thing with uh, stuff like the invisibility cloak that he has and some of the uh, like snooper Zed Ray things. Um, there are limitations and rules for how they can be used. So really good, in my opinion, uh, science fiction idea world building. Um, Maybe not so much the taking into account all the, uh, um, well, yeah, no, you've got uh, countermeasures to a bunch of that stuff as well. So there is there was definite thought that went into it, and I approve of that. Um, I have read mountains of stories and full books that don't in any way, like, we'll, we'll drop some cool idea, and they're like, ah, oh, here's this neat idea, so-and-so can do X, Y, or Z, and then proceeds to completely undermine what makes that, or, and, or, or it'll, like, act like that uh, particular thing is really special, and then the narrative proceeds to, or the author contrives to render that special thing completely moot at every turn. Um, so it's... It's really nice when somebody has a sense of internal consistency, uh, and I approve of that. Um, I would say that um, the Lensman series sort of skirts real carefully on that. Lensman gets a pass in that regard, I feel, simply because it, uh, like, the entire story of that series is a constant escalation uh, between the forces of good. Uh, working for the Galactic Patrol and uh, the forces of evil, the Bosconians, the B pirates of Boscone, and, uh, you know, their actual overlord masters. Um, uh, so it's kind of this constant, this, this constant escalation with every single iteration of that series. Uh, so you go from, you know, oh, uh, psychic uber mention to uh literal black hole uh guns over the space of a couple novels pretty quickly uh or antimatter black hole weapons as well as uh the quote nutcracker unquote which is m like my favorite sci-fi super weapon of all time <laughs> because uh so in the lensman universe there's uh the way they're able to get around the universe very quickly uh, and go faster than light, which is obviously bogus, is they have a uh, something that renders their space, ves space vessels inertialess. Uh, and the rules for that are very, very consistently thought out and adhered to pretty solidly uh, by E.E. E. Doc Smith, the author. Um, but uh, by taking that technology for the inertia inertialess uh, device, that makes it so that ships can go through the ether quickly. Um, if you take that technology and then scale it up and then slap it on two planets that are uh, flying in direct... So, okay, so what I have to do is describe how the technology works. And I am definitely going to read the Lensman stuff aloud here. That's like, that's a given. That's like the end goal. 
um, because I love those so much. That's part of why I started this, but I'm kind of working my way up to it. Um, so the way the inertial uh, canceling technology works is you've got an object and uh, you turn on the inertial dampening device. Uh, any momentum and movement that that object had before you turned on the inertial dampener, and it has a name, and I don't remember what it is right now, um, it'll... Bergenholms? I want to say it's the Bergenholms. Uh, the Bergenholm devices, uh, I might be mangling that, but it doesn't matter right now. Uh, all that momentum is preserved, uh, but is completely disabled with the inertial uh, dampener, the Bergenholms. Um, as soon as you turn that Bergenholm off, the object resumes its uh, its previous momentum and trajectory. So you have to you can't just use it to fly and land onto a planet because when you turn off the device, um, a all your people, everybody on the vessel is also rendered inertialess and therefore can't iner uh, can't interact with anything with uh, inertia and mass, but uh, once you turn it off, everybody goes flying. Um, so that's why you can't just stay inertialist all the time. But once you turn it off, you uh, you start moving at your previous trajectory and movement. So if you're a space vessel in orbit around Earth that just turned off your or turned on your um, Bergenholm inertial dampening system, and then you fly to another planet that is flying at a you know half a galaxy away that's flying at a completely different trajectory. Uh, suddenly it's you're moving that way and it's moving the other way entirely. Um, so you have to basically go into the system uh, or go near the system, turn off your inertial dampener, and then fly in manually after doing your course corrections. Um, this has serious repercussions as well for uh, people who have to escape an inertialist ship for whatever reason. And those are delved into pretty well, and they have actual ideas there. You know, they have actual uh, protocols for handling that. Uh, very good and in consistent internal logic. But back to my previous thing about the Nutcracker, which is my favorite, one of my favorite science fiction super weapons and doomsday devices of all time. So you take these Bergenholms, you upscale, you scale them way up so that you can render an entire celestial body, either a planet or a big asteroid. Um, uh, inertialess, uh, and you find another one that's moving at exactly the opposite, in the exact opposite direction, uh, with the same exact opposite velocity uh, and momentum, then you in Bergenholm it, you uh, inertial dampen it, and then you move these two things toward whatever offending force that you've encountered. Call it an enemy stronghold, a giant super fortress the size of the Death Star. Uh, yes, that is a thing. Um, uh, very much so. Uh, and then you turn off the inertial dampeners and they go, wabap, and they, uh, sandwich whatever it is that you want obliterated. It is so cool. Uh, so ridiculously over the top. So one of the things I love most about Wensman is it just, it's, it, it makes like the zaniest space opera, like anything be it an anime or what or, or whatever or, or movie make it seem friggin tame it's just completely bonkers it goes nuts uh and it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun uh don't uh it's it is sometimes kind of hard to look at it with through uh modern eyes because there are some dated ideas and mentalities there uh but it's still a lot of fun all right, I have rambled on for like 10 minutes extolling the virtues of the Lensman series that I'm not going to read for months yet. Um, so crunchy. Um, so yeah, thanks for tuning in. I do do this every Saturday. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Mehdi Cousineau, uh, you enjoyed this. Uh, shout outs to Rob uh, for... Uh, the re the suggestion suggestion the request uh, for the last question by Isaac Asimov, which I will be doing next week. Um, and I do other streams throughout the week. I have a Mecha Monday stream where I do something giant robot related or Mecha adjacent. I have a Warframe Wednesdays stream uh, where I do something Warframe related for a couple hours. And uh, every Saturday, I have the Storytime Saturdays, where I read uh, either 
full novels or short stories or short story collections or novellas or what have you allowed. And I do take requests. Um, I cannot guarantee that I will do your request immediately. I cannot guarantee that I will do your request at all. Uh, if you give me something really filthy and awful to read, I'm probably not going to do it. Um, but I will definitely at least look into it and probably do it. Um, <laughs> I don't want to discourage people, but I'm also I'm also not going to be like, please, please. I'm I'm going to be honest. Don't be an internet denizen and like try and make me read someone's like erotic fan fiction. I'm not going to do it. Sorry. That's I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Um, unless it's got really good, cool other stuff in it, too, then maybe I'll think about it. Uh, <laughs> I countermand myself at every turn. I shoot myself in the foot. In any case, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'll try and get this uploaded to YouTube shortly, but I'm already like two weeks behind. So thank you again. Have a good one, folks. It's been fun. Bye. <laughs>